Good Sunday morning. My name is Jaden Jefferson, and welcome to this week's Community Focus. My guest is Toledo Mayor Wade Caps Cabbage. We're discussing his 2025 budget proposal. What's in it? How the absence of American Rescue Plan Act dollars this time around played into the decision making, as well as city employee wages. But before we even dive into all the budget stuff, I guess we can first start out with 2024 versus 2025. We're kind of at the end of 2024 here. And so looking at this year so far, what would you say have been the biggest successes and then also the not so successful stories from 2024? Well, I think when we look back on 2024, uh, one of the uh, the big successes of this year is um, the improvement that we've seen in our crime rate. Um, and in particularly our violent crime rates and homicides. Crime is down in every category, every single category we measure, from auto thefts to burglaries to homicides, they're all lower in 2024 than they were in 2023. And in the case of violent crime and homicides, the numbers are, are pretty significantly lower. Uh, last year, 23 to 22, we saw about a 30% reduction in homicides, which was three times uh, better than the national average. Um, this year, we're down again. And we're on pace to see homicides go down for the third straight year. And we're about roughly half the number of homicides that uh, that we had as recently as 2021. So we're certainly not satisfied in, until those numbers are zero. And even though intellectually we know that maybe they never will be, that is our goal. Um, but but w I think it, it's also fair to celebrate the progress we've made in that area. So that's one thing that jumps to mind. I think another big thing that happened this year that maybe didn't get as much attention, but it, it's significant to the taxpayers of Toledo, is we uh, had our bond rating increased for the first time in 14 years. Um, Standard and Poor and um, Moody's uh, rates uh, all cities in the country. And the last time the city of Toledo had its bond rating increased was 2010. So uh, the fact that we uh, got an upgrade from the, uh, the big rating agencies is an indication that, you know, financially we are, uh, you know, we're holding our own. So uh, there's a number of other successful things that, you know, continuing uh, progress along the riverfront, you know, continuing to fix more roads than ever before. Uh, but to answer the other part of your question, you know, maybe things that didn't, haven't gone well, you know, it's maybe not necessarily in the purview of city government per se, uh, but the news that we received, you know, a couple weeks ago about the layoffs of Jeep are certainly something that should concern all of us. Um, you know, again, it's it's not necessarily something that city government, uh, you know, has a control over, but it definitely affects our uh, community, uh, not just the, the families that are affected, uh, just from a budget standpoint. Um, the, those layoffs, um, next year alone, uh, you know, are going to produce about a $2 million hit to our general fund. So that just, um, you know, causes, you know, stress to our budget that already was going to be there because, um, of the end ending of the American rescue plan dollar. So just like any other year, you know, there's good and there's bad. I, I do think that the, the good outweighed the bad in 24, we took two steps forward for every step back. Um, but it's the reality of, a, you know, being a, you know, a big city, you're going to have uh, some good things happen, some bad things happen. I think we do have some momentum, made some progress, and I'm looking forward to making more progress uh, next year in 2025. And I'm glad we kind of brought up that part of this where we're looking at a budget, but re in reality, a budget is really just the income revenues that we collect, property revenues we collect, yep. but kind of put in perspective these Jeep layoffs. And also, really what that says about the future of our economy. We're very yeah. heavily in manufacturing, and that can kind of be a challenge when you have layoffs happening. Um, let me unpack all of that and try to uh, provide answers to all those questions. Um, you're right. The um, Our budget in the city of Toledo, and really uh, the, the cities of Ohio, um, is really governed by the income tax. I had thought Frankly, you know, as I was, you know, growing up and, you know, becoming an adult, a young, young adult and then an adult that every city in the country uh, was funded through an income tax, just because I knew that that's how it was here in Toledo and in Ohio. Come to find out we are rare um, among states in this union uh, for that funding formula. Most other cities get most of their money from a property tax, the way our schools do. 
for whatever reason, you know, back in 1911 or 1913 or whatever the uh, Ohio had its constitutional, uh, most recent constitutional convention, uh, they decided to do it differently. And they decided to make the engine of city government the income tax, it makes us very rare in this country. And frankly, it's one of the reasons that the cities uh, of Ohio were uniquely hurt during the pandemic. Because if we get essentially our money from an income tax, well, when people are ordered not to work, you know, there's a real negative impact there. So that's why it's important. It's because our system happens to rely on an income tax as opposed to a property tax like the schools rely on or a sales tax like the county commissioners rely on. For us, it's an income tax, just how it is. So when you have, um, uh, you know, bad news like the layoffs at Jeep, you know, just to put it bluntly, when in that case, 1,100 people uh, aren't going to be working, they're not going to be earning an income, well, the city of Toledo doesn't derive an, a, a benefit from, from that income tax, uh, you know, and that can add up. However, um, if we're going to talk about the negative things, you know, we also have to recognize that there are some positive things that have happened in our economy um, in recent times. ProMedica, which by far is our largest employer. I mean, overwhelmingly is our largest employer, um, has received much more favorable economic news here in the last year and a half, two years. I think everyone knows in the height of the pandemic, they really uh, had some struggles. There was some worry that, um, you know, all the rumors were going around about what their future was and were they going to, you know, get bought out by the Cleveland Clinic or, you know, what, all kinds of rumors you were hearing. Well, now, I mean, they, they have turned the ship around and uh, they're starting to turn a profit again. Well, that helps our, our income tax. Um, so it is important to, to keep an eye um, on when things happen, like at Jeep. It is worth pointing out, though, that while you're right, uh, Toledo is proud of its manufacturing DNA, so to speak, and that we are known for being a hardworking place where, you know, we roll up our sleeves and we make glass and we make cars and parts for cars and all, you know, all those things. We do do that. We now actually have diversified our economy pretty substantially to the point where manufacturing in the classic sense only represents about 15 percent of our economy. Um, now, by you know, overwhelmingly, our largest employer is a healthcare uh, company and Mercy is right up there, too. They're also a top five employer. So manufacture is important. Don't get me wrong. And, and there's no worse impact than the families who you know, have been laid off. But in terms of how city government um, deals with uh, things like this. You know, just like I answered, you know, the earlier question about how things are going in the city in general, even when it comes to the economy, there are negative, there's negative job news from time to time, but then there are also positive things like ProMedica's turnaround and, you know, the work that we're doing to turn the old North Town Mall into a, you know, a, a tier one supplier for the auto industry. So. To some extent, I like to think it, you know, kind of balances out, but we have to be mindful of it. And it is ba it, it is core to our projections when we go to build a budget and pass a budget. What we expect to collect in income taxes is something that we have to project. And then all throughout the year, we monitor whether the collections are coming in the way we think that they are. And if they're not, city council adjusts it and we go from there. So we've been pretty fortunate over the last several years to have strong income tax collections. And the indications are that that will continue, even despite some you know hiccups along the way. And one industry we've seen tremendous growth in, even just in the last year, has been tech, no doubt about that, with artificial intelligence. And does it concern you, though, that Toledo maybe hasn't made the strides it needs to make in bringing more technology-based opportunities to the area or work-from-home positions? Well, I, I think, um, I don't think it has to be an either or. I, I, th um, I think our strong manufacturing DNA and our history as, as uh, a, a, a manufacturing hub can go hand in hand with technology and innovation. And I think we saw that just recently, in fact, here within the last six months when Governor DeWine in the state of Ohio awarded us, Toledo was the very first site in the entire state selected uh, for one of his uh, innovation hub grants. So this is a $30 million grant um, focused in this case on the glass industry and, and uh, its historic roots in Toledo, but also with an eye toward innovation. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of 
of that $30 million grant, a lot of that is going to go to uh, research and development and other technologies that are going to make, uh, you know, glass production more efficient to try to, you know, do it in a new and better way. There's, you know, things you don't look at the, uh, you know, your cell phone, you don't think of that. I mean, glass isn't necessarily, you know, just the, you know, the cup you drink uh, out of, or, you know, the windshield of your car. I mean, think of the glass in a cell phone uh, and all of these, all of that. I mean, cell phones weren't used nearly the same way, even as recently as 10 years ago as, as they are now. All of that requires an innovation uh, that those big glass companies in town, whether it's Libby Glass or Owens, Illinois, Owens Corning, a little less so, but they still obviously have a glass component. Um, for, and for solar, you were talking about uh, solar uh, solar panel technology that actually has roots in the glass industry. So it is, so to some extent you hear that and you hear, you know, manufacturing, um, you know, Edward Drummond Libby and, and uh, Michael Owens and, you know, old school uh, manufacturing. But anymore, uh, to succeed, you have to have an R&D tech component. And I think we would not have won that grant. We would not have been the first recipient of uh, the state's innovation hub if there wasn't a pretty substantial investment in technology. So we, we um, you know, I don't know that we should compare ourselves to, I don't know, uh, you know, Silicon Valley or, you know, places that are probably ahead of us when it comes to high tech. But I think we're pr competing pretty well here in the Midwest in our own state. And looking at this budget here, what are some of the top investments that we are going to be making? Because, of course, we are losing out on those ARPA dollars, which have to be spent by the end of 2024. And that changes things significantly because you're going from this much money to work with to this much money to work yeah. with. And so kind of talk about how city council and your office are working to make sure that the money that we do have is going to the different places that need it. Well, Toledo was very fortunate to receive about $180 million uh, from the federal government in American Rescue Plan dollars. It's the largest federal investment in Toledo since uh, Franklin Roosevelt and, you know, the New Deal, the Great Depression, worked, you know, the WPA and, you know, uh, so many of those buildings around town, are, you can still trace the roots to them, uh, to the, the, some buildings at the university and the zoo and so much uh, from the New Deal. Well, we haven't had a, an investment like that in Toledo uh, since then that was as, as great as this. So um, you're right, Congress, when they appropriated that money, uh, said that it had to be spent by the end of 2024. And so we were true to that and we did spend it by the end of 2024. And it does create unique challenges as we look ahead to next year. However, it's not as though it was a surprise to us. We knew all along that this day was coming and we planned for it. Um, most of the money spent uh, of those American Rescue Plan dollars were spent on one-time sort of capital projects that didn't create legacy costs. Um, so whether that was replacing all of the lead service lines, um, the, the private lead service lines that existed in Toledo, so we don't run into the problem that they had in Flint several years ago with water, you know, kind of passing through lead-encrusted pipes. We've eliminated that problem totally uh, with ARP dollars, whether it's the construction of the new Wayman Palmer YMCA, which we should have a grand opening for shortly after the beginning of the new year, shooting for maybe February, March at the latest, to all of the many improvements you've seen in parks, what's happening at Savage Park and elsewhere. All of those were ARP dollars. And actually, we're going to see some of the more exciting ones be completed here in the next year or so, even though the money is kind of already off our books. So the first thing we did anticipating it was to make sure that we weren't creating legacy costs, that we were spending our ARP dollars on, you know, to the extent possible, building things on construction um, as opposed to salaries, for instance. Um, secondly, we anticipated that this was going to be happening. So we, our budget it was nimble enough to anticipate this moment. And so the budget that um, City Council is now debating, and they began their hearings uh, this week uh, with an eye toward, you know, passing it, you know, after the first of the year has to pass by March 31st. It'll probably pass, my guess, is sometime in, you know, maybe late January or so. Um, the budget we presented, even at the end of next year, not the end of this year, not 2024, but about 13 months from now, our budget will still 
have about $60 million in the rainy day fund, or we call it the budget stabilization fund. And just out of a sense of context, the day I became mayor uh, seven years ago, we had about somewhere between 10 to $15 million in that fund. So after everything we've been through, COVID and everything that we've done, growing the size of the police force uh, and all the investments in roads and, and uh, you know, building new YMCAs, all that, after all of that, at the end of next year, we will still have four times more money in reserves than we had the day I became mayor. I think that's one of the reasons, you know, the, uh, you know, we, our, our bond rating was increased because the big investment houses see that and they see it as being a, you know, a, a wise and frugal investment in dollars. So at the end of the next year, we're still going to be four times better off than we were the day I became mayor. And yet we're still going to do some really important things this year. Uh, we're going to have another police class, of course. We're going to have another fire class. The, we have grown the size of our police department uh, since I became mayor. When I became mayor, we had about 585 uh, officers uh, protecting us. Now that number it varies from day to day because of retirements and such, but now it's about 635. So that's you know, that's about a net gain of about 50 officers uh, over uh, over seven years. That's a pretty significant net gain. Uh, and it's not the only reason, but I think it's one of the reasons that we've seen uh, an improvement in our safety statistics. So we're going to have a police class and a fire class. We're also investing in um, a lot of the tools and technologies that our firefighters and police officers need. So whether it's, there are cap, in other words, there are capital expenditures you'll see in this budget, whether it's for, you know, uh, improvements to fire stations or new police squad cars, public safety is a big part of this budget. Youth, we learned during the pandemic, we learned frankly from our ARP dollars, how valuable um, in, uh, youth pro programming can be. Before the pandemic, the city of Toledo wasn't spending any money, I mean, zero on youth programming. When we got those ARP dollars, we had the ability to uh, create a pretty robust uh, youth series of youth programs. And that's why over the last three summers, kids have had access to over a hundred free programs a year, with, I mean, not just sports, though also sports, but you know, you want to learn how to podcast, you want to learn how to code. I think we even had a class if you want to learn how to ride a horse. I mean, heck, we had everything. Um, that the city of Toledo had not invested in that its own money. Um, but we saw during COVID with those ARP dollars, how valuable, valuable it was. And again, I think that is a, another reason. There's many reasons, but another one of the reasons that our, uh, our crime statistics are moving in the right direction. So in this budget, um, we decided to invest about a quarter of a million dollars in youth programming. Again, before COVID, it was zero. We were investing anything in it. So public safety is a big uh, uh, area in this budget. Youth programming, um, frankly, for the first time in a long time coming out of our general fund is a big priority of this budget. Um, economic development programs are a vibrancy initiative, whether it's the facade grant or the uh, white box grants, that's gonna be a big part of this. Obviously, uh, roads are a big part of uh, what we do now in the city of Toledo with our quarter percent roads levy, we're gonna be able to uh, fix about 42 lane miles this year. In contrast, before that levy passed in 2020, we were we fixed less than three lane miles a year. So we're going to see those core investments in, in the services people care about funded in this budget, public safety, youth, um, basic services, you know, like road repair and construction. Um, you know, but we're going to do it mindful that, uh, you know, this $180 million is rolling off our books. Fortunately, and maybe the last thing I, I'll say, we've had a, just a fantastic job uh, earning federal grants over the last two years. We've brought in $156 million of grants, competitive federal grants. The ARP dollars, every city received a certain amount of that. You didn't have to compete for it. On top of that, we've gotten $156 million of competitive grants that we've had, we have had to compete for. We've had to, you know, uh, battle it out with all the other cities in the country to get our hands on uh, uh, dollars that we can use to supplement all the things we've done. So $156 million over two years, frankly, is comparable to what we got from the American Rescue Plan. And the amount we got from the American Rescue Plan was the largest investment since the New Deal. So I don't want to forget to praise our grant writing team because that $156 million is, is money we really couldn't expect. We had to earn it. And so whether it is 
the plant, the uh, $6 million we got from the U.S. Forestry uh, Department to plant 10,000 new trees throughout Toledo, whether it's the $50 million we got from two different uh, U.S. Department of Transportation grants to make infrastructure improvements in the Junction neighborhood and uh, over in East Toledo near the new Metro Park. That's a big part of this budget, too, and a big part of what citizens should, should frankly, uh, be proud of uh, when they look at this budget. And one thing I hear you say often, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, is that a budget shows what your priorities are. And now we're starting to see some investment in youth programming a lot more than before. And that's kind of one thing that I think will be a standout part of how we spent our ARPA dollars was that whole list of youth programs. And of course, one thing you mentioned was investing in policing to combat the crime, and then also having youth programming as a part of that as well, because when kids have something to do, they won't have to commit crime to have something to do. And so how do you think those two are going to actually increase over time together in a proportional sense? So then as we're making those investments in policing, we're making those same investments in youth programming. So will we have a future where both of those things can happen at the same time with equal amount of time and investment? Yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. And I think you see that even here in this budget. I mean, even without these ARP dollars and make no mistake, the ARP dollars were helpful to us in um, investing in our police department and uh, in providing youth programming. But even with those dollars off the books, we, because we do prioritize it, because we do value it, we have decided to continue to grow the size of the police force with another police class. We've decided to, again, really for the first time in a long time, use our own dollars, quarter of a million dollars in this case, to invest in youth programming. Um, crime is, um, you know, there are a series of complex factors that go into to why crime occurs. Anything that is um, that with so many different moving parts um, isn't gonna be solved with a magic wand or, or one simple thing. Um, in my judgment, it's going to be solved by a lot of things, all working in unison. So the fact that we've grown the police department, the size of the force, is part of the reason uh, that our crime numbers are improving. But so is the fact that we've invested in youth programming. So is the fact that we're doing a better job fighting blight and sort of the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the built environment in some neighborhoods um, can contribute to the sense of hopelessness that often leads to crime. So the investments we've made, you know, uh, fighting blight and going after, you know, abandoned houses and, you know, derelict properties and things like that, that matters too. Our, our Monsey Department, uh, Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, led by Malcolm Cun Cunningham with the violence interrupters and such, that's another part of it. Again, it's crime isn't caused by any one thing, so it's not going to be solved by any one simple solution. In our judgment, it's going to be solved by doing a whole bunch of things. And I think that's part of what we learned during the pandemic. And now coming out of the pandemic, moving away from some of those federal dollars, we if we believe that, we have to put the proof in the pudding and, start, and invest in it. And even in a tighter budget, we did that this year because we know it makes sense to grow the size of the police force. We know it makes sense to give kids positive alternatives, especially during the summer. We know it makes sense you know, to, to fight blight and to, you know, restore a sense of hope in neighborhoods. So we're going to continue doing those things, even when times are a little tighter budget-wise, uh, may, maybe than they have been. And one other part of the budget I want to look at, and this is the other part people don't realize is a large part, portion of this, is payroll and ensuring that those jobs are competitive. Because one thing government has to fight is jobs that pay more in the private sector. And so yeah. in this budget, how much, how much has the city done to really keep those positions competitive. Yeah. The, um, you know, we had been behind uh, in terms of uh, paying a competitive wage for our employees, in particular, for our uh, safety forces. I think we've caught up and, um, you know, gotten to a point where now we, we do, uh, we are more comparable to uh, what a firefighter, a police officer, or any city employee could get by working uh, in a comparable city. But it's a big part of it. I mean, right now, not just in Toledo, but across the country, um, uh, cities are finding it difficult to find people, just to take one example, to be police officers. I mean, it's recruiting. Um, cities are having a hard time recruiting people to be police officers. It's, a, it's always been a hard job. It's an even harder job in the current environment. And so 
finding ways to incentivize uh, a, a diverse group of applicants to want to be police officers is something that city of Toledo needs to do. And one of the ways to do that is by uh, paying uh, officers a competitive wage. Um, when I became mayor, a Toledo police officer, uh, an entry level police officer in Toledo made less than a Toledo police, than a police officer in Sylvania, Maumee, Perrysburg, and I think Oregon. And who do you think had, has a tougher job? Obviously the officer in Toledo has a tougher job and yet he or she was being paid less. Now we corrected that in uh, our last contract and, is, and we're very close I don't think we have a tentative agreement yet, but we are very, very close to having a, uh, an agreement with our uh, police officers for this contract season. We are continuing uh, to correct what I think was a mistake. I mean, given the difficulty of that job, we need to make sure that someone can't leave the Toledo Police Department, go to Perrysburg, where frankly the job is probably easier, and get more money doing it. It's just not fair and it's it's not um it, it doesn't protect the safety of the citizens of Toledo so that, that's that's a good point uh salaries are a huge part of any budget um salaries are typically about 85 to 90 percent of any budget for anything um and in our budget public safety police and fire is about 85 percent of everything we do I mean we collect snow and or I'm sorry, plow snow and collect leaves and you know deliver drinking water and maintain rec program we do all those things those are all important things, but yet 85 cents of every dollar goes to public safety. So um, the budget that we've introduced contemplates um, across the board 4% uh, pay raises for every uh, for the employees of the city of Toledo because we need to make sure that there's an incentive to want to do the difficult but important work that all of our city employees do. So that's been contemplated in this budget. That's We, we didn't forget about that. That's a big part of what we need to do. Yes, and we have, of course, until March for City Council to pass that budget. So there also are going to be some opportunities for residents to chime in on this budget as well, just to end off there. So kind of talk about how residents can engage with this as well. Yep. So what, by charter, the mayor has to present his or her budget to City Council by November 15th. Uh, that's, that's, just, that's just in the charter. So November 15th, the mayor has to present his or her budget. We've done that. The charter also says that city council must approve the budget by March 31st. That's the, that's the stage we're at right now. So now that the budget has been presented to city council, city council has, it can take as much or as little time as it likes, uh, but it has you know, the potential of several months now to debate the budget and amend it. This is, this is not the final document by any means. Um, this, this is maybe sort of a starting point um, uh, or a draft. The final say will come from city council and city council's decisions will be informed by the input from citizens. Uh, that, that is something that's important to all of us and important to city council. So now as city council begins its process, it's a process that will involve committee hearings, public hearings, uh, and in fact, they've already begun. Uh, the first couple hearings uh, were this week. They're gonna continue over the next several weeks. It'll be a little tough with Thanksgiving coming up, but they're gonna go into December. They're all public hearings. So the public is invited to attend and then uh, comment. There'll be a, com a comment period um, at the public meetings. If you can't make the public meeting, you can uh, go online and you can uh, hyperlink and, and watch a, a stream of the hearings or, or watch a recording of it. Obviously in the modern age, you can send emails and. Uh, you know, reach out on Facebook and all kinds of different ways to express your opinion, but, and, but it will be taken seriously. And that input will uh, form city, help inform city council's thinking as it moves forward to pass a final budget by March 31st. So um, always want to encourage the citizens to, again, go to our website and you can uh, click on the link and read everything that's been presented. You can also see the, um, the schedule of when these hearings are taking place, different ways that you can contact members of city council. Um, public input is a big part of this and that's the stage we're at right now. So I, I hope to hear uh, from the public as we move toward uh, final passage of this budget. Well, Toledo Mayor Wade Caps the Cabbage, thanks for joining me on Community Focus. All right, thanks for having me. And that is this week's show. Thanks for watching and have a great start to the week on Monday.